Welcome to the Present Fathers Podcast. This is the show that focuses on climbing the mountain of fatherhood together. We believe that dads matter. That's why this show is for you. So gear up, dads. Get ready. It's time to start climbing. Welcome to the Present Fathers Podcast. Our guest tonight is Barton Ramsey. Barton is a close friend of the twins. And uh, backstage, we just reminded ourselves that we have actually met before also. And Barton is a father of three. He's a proud husband. He's the owner of the Southern Oak Kennels, a successful dog trainer, former rock band member, and an associate youth pastor. Did I miss anything there, Barton? Yeah, I have a tech company. Tech company. Uh, All right. We own a dog training company that teaches people how to train their own dogs. It's an online learning platform. So that's the only thing you missed, though. Super cool. All <laughs> right. Well, sorry I missed that one. That's a lot, That sounds awesome. So, Barton, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your family, and uh, we'll kind of just let the audience get to know you a little bit. Yeah, for sure. I grew up in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, along with the twins, um, graduated from high school here and played metal in a, in a, I hate to call it a Christian metal band, but it was a, it was a bunch of metalheads that believed in Jesus. Right. So that was the, love the, it. the premise. And we wrote songs that, I mean, the old Testament is full of a bunch of super metal stuff. So, oh, dude, yeah. uh, we wrote songs about that and toured around the world and didn't eat meat, you know, regrettably. And, did the whole trendy like Christian straight edge metal thing. And um, in like 2006, I had not gone to college yet. And my dad, my dad was the photographer around here. So like the twins and all their brother, like everyone's school pictures around here was taken by my dad, my granddad. So everyone knew my family. And uh, he was like, he would always say, Hey, you know, whenever you decide to go to college, I'll pay for it. Like I want you to get an education. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And um, finally, those conversations changed to like, hey, if you want me to pay for your college, you should probably go. <laughs> and I was like, dang, I'm going to miss this boat. So my uncle lived in Dallas and worked at a church that had a like a seminary attached to it called Criswell College. And I called him and he had just been through a pretty gnarly divorce. He was my hero. I'm sure we'll get into talking about him. He was kind of my mentor spiritually. And I said, Hey, can I come live with you and like go to that school? And, um, so I moved out to Dallas, went to, um, an undergrad seminary. So I kind of skipped the whole, like go to college and then seminary. Like I did the biblical studies, theology degree right off the bat. Um, met my wife there in Dallas, got married really young, 21 and 19. That was in 2008. We just had our 15th anniversary and, um, Congratulations. Yeah. So moved on from that, became a student pastor and then a family discipleship pastor, started training dogs like for fun. And then it was, it was kind of one of those like, Hey, if you're going to have this hobby, it can't cost so much. So I started figuring out ways to make it make money. And that led to it becoming like, I, I sat down in maybe 2014 or 15 with my accountant, which was my dad's accountant. I just like inherited this guy he was like, Hey, you owe a bunch of taxes. And I was like, do what? You know, the church takes out money. It was like, well, you made a lot of money, a lot more money at your, your other deal than you did at your, your church deal. And I was like, the church deal is my full-time job. Like I, I can't make more money at the other deal. And he's like, well, you did. So we started exploring what it would look like to just go the entrepreneur route. Uh, and we love the freedom that provided for our family truly. Um, so we started the online platform around then 2016, 17, and yeah, we uh, we have three kiddos that are 12, 10, and 8. Happy to chat about them. We homeschool out on a 20-acre property about 20 miles north of Tupelo. And uh, yeah, just kind of living life, herding cats. My wife's actually speaking at an event this week. And uh, so she's on her way home from New Orleans right now. So I've been a single dad for the last three days. And that's it's pretty fun. It's pretty, yeah, pretty wild. I, d I did that last week. I only have one kiddo, but... Uh... Yeah, wife is out of town, so we caught you right now that you're all depleted and tired and worn out. And now we're gonna do this podcast. So hope you're no, ready. I'm just super happy to talk to <laughs> adults. Yeah, <laughs> oh right. God, this these conversations are wearing on me, you know. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's continue the adult conversation and do your your therapy live right here. So, um, tell us a little bit about that uncle relationship, and I guess with your dad too. It sounds like your dad was you know very present, very involved, and yeah, for sure, provided well. So, tell us a little bit about more of the roles that those men played for you, and how that's prepared you to be a dad, and how you've taken those lessons. Moving. Man, um, I'll start with my dad. He, he's a great guy. I had lunch with him today. He is truly one of my best friends. Um, 
we we grew up, we were a, a Christian home. Like we went to church on Sundays. We had Bibles like around our house, but I mean, maybe prayed before family meals if everyone was together. And my dad made sure that we were like at church, but that was really the extent of the spiritual like discipleship that took place in our home, which I feel like is probably 90 plus percent of families around here. You know, it's like, hey, church is one of those deals. You just go. Everyone goes. And um, discipleship didn't really take place per se. My dad loved us very well. He was an excellent father. Um, the the most lacking part would have been spiritual, you know, and and he's the oldest of four brothers. The third uh, was went to seminary, became a youth pastor and sort of I was a preteen when he was a youth minister. And I was like, he's the coolest person on earth, you know. And so he became a, a college minister in Dallas, Texas, at First Baptist Dallas when I was in like middle school going into high school. And would invite me on all the mission trips, the the camps, the ski trips. And these, I mean, First Baptist Dallas is, there's a lot of connection there. So the people that were like our ski trips, the worship leaders were Shane and Shane. So, or David Crowder. And the guys that were speaking were like these dudes that were wild. I didn't know any different. I just thought they were just bros. Like I was like, oh, these dudes are cool. But they were like, <laughs> big, you know, and uh, in fact, I saw Shane and Shane the other night at uh, at your church, Brandon, which was super awesome because I, I walked in and I was like, what's up, dudes? Like I hadn't seen him in probably 12 <laughs> years. Um, but he he really was my spiritual influence. And, and I'm thankful for that, for the Lord providing like a, a father who loved us well. I learned a lot of things about being a dad from my dad. I also learned a lot of what I ne didn't necessarily want to do as a dad. Um but my uncle was the one that spiritually was that anchor. Uh, and I, I, I keep that pretty close at heart because I feel like statistically speaking, you really need that one person, someone who's spiritually like leading and guiding and discipling you. Uh, or it's easy to just, you know, get to 18 and say, peace, you know, I'm, I've got freedom. I don't have, no one's making me go to church every Wednesday. I'm out of here. So he was really that guy for me, and um, I mean, we're still super close. He's in Dallas, Texas, and his son, I think I'm that guy for his son, and he works for me now. He owns one of my kennel locations in Texas, so um, it's it's cool to see that sort of replicated yeah. through generations with us. That's beautiful to kind of see it, you know, carrying forward. Yeah. All, all his work is now kind of being reinvested in, in his That's son. That's right. That's awesome. Well, his son, his son was a football – Stone is his name, and he's he was a football player in high school. He was really good, got – recruited by a lot of D one schools and really just like, could, I mean, he played really well, but it like discipline wise and girls and just, he had a tough time in college. And uh, my uncle was like, all right, you can join the military or you can go live with cousin Barton and learn how to train dogs. So he chose cousin Barton. And uh, there was multiple times that I was like, Hey bud, military might've been a better choice. Cause I'm like, <laughs> I'll get you out of here. But we're super tight now and he's doing really well, but yeah, it's, it's, it's cool to see that kind of passed down. And I felt like a um, healthy sense of obligation. You know, I was like, Hey, that guy, I get to do this now. I mean, this guy, my uncle invested, I lived with him for three years. He officiated my wedding with Bethany. Really like he was like our, when we dated and we went home from a date, he was there. So we talked relationships and all that with him. And uh, it was, it was fantastic. So I'm, I'm happy to kind of reinvest that with him. Yeah. And so you're, you, so as you said, your uncle is the one that was kind of your spiritual anchor and, and kind of the one that helped you with your, your walk and your maturity. And your dad seemed to be the one that just always supported you in anything that you had an idea of. So my, my question is, with, with your dad doing that, supporting everything, was, was there anything that was working um, that you, you wanted to, to stick with? And then you just kind of the dogs fell in, into the into play or like how did that affect your your life's trajectory, I guess, is what my question is. Yeah, um, my dad's like way of loving people is, is giving gifts and he's, you know, financially, you know, for living in Mississippi, it doesn't cost a lot to live here, but he's well off, you know, he's, he's done really well career wise. And so we didn't ever want for anything. We had everything we needed. And he was so supportive that sometimes it was annoying. Sometimes it was like, Hey man, like I'm married. I have kids. Like I got a family of my own, but, 
I really could use that 10 grand, you know, to buy this deal for my business. So yeah, let's just not talk about it. You know, it was like, I, I wanted to be independent. You know, I wanted to, and I was, a I was a youth pastor, discipleship pastor. That is not a lucrative career. You know, I mean, that's, yeah, you're sorry, not, sorry. you're not, you know, investing. That's news to me. What? Yeah. You're not, you're not taking the, uh, any sort of nice vacations with your family. Um, not that those things are most important, but I was, I was, I wanted to spend that kind of time. I grew up with a family where we, we went to Destin, you know, we, we went on ski trips, we did stuff like that. And I was like, at one point we started having kids and I realized if I didn't find some sort of supplemental income, we're never going to do that. My kids are not going to experience that. The boat's a good one. I'm sure we'll get to that, but just, I grew up on a boat. And so I wanted my kids to grow up on the water. Unless someone invites you as a youth pastor, you're, you're not going to, unless you want to fish from the bank. Uh, so <laughs> You know, my dad would, and I didn't really understand this. I was 22, 23, 24 when I really started getting into the Southern Oak Kennels journey. And he would constantly call, you need anything? You know, and he saw the vision that I had. And when I say he believed in it, I mean, 110%, he would have given me his last dollar just to get this going. And so Bethany, the other day we were talking about this and, she she made some comment about how she's like yeah like we haven't borrowed money from your dad and I was like yeah in like seven years like a long time you know but those first few years of my business he was the bank you know it was like hey interest free what do you need you need a dog trailer wow. you need a new stud dog and and believed in that in such a way that it really enabled me to like I don't know when you when you're there's a there's a lot to be said of people who go all in and they're like hey if this doesn't work I have nothing to fall back on. I think that there's probably some motivation that comes from that. For me, it was a little different. It was like, Hey, at the end of the day, I have a dad who I know is not going to let us like lose the house. Um, he's not, so I can, I can go all the way all in because I'm not really risking my kids, like not eating a good meal. Because yeah. of my dad. So yeah. he was supportive in that way. If, if that makes sense. It makes yeah. It braver. Yeah. Completely. Oh, just, yeah, and this is this is like what we talk about, right? This is the goal of involved, successful fatherhood is you're able to bless your kids in this way, right? So obviously the stories where someone overcomes immense hardship and that, you know, hey, this is my only shot. If I didn't make it, I was doomed type of thing. Those are inspiring. Um, and there's a lot of people who have been successful that way, but that's not the ideal. Right? And I, I think a lot of those right. people too would say, I hope to provide better for my kids. Yeah. Um, and so- yeah, it's good to hear that like your story is in a lot of ways like the ideal that people should aspire to uh, to rise to and for, pass it on to the next generation. So thanks yeah. for sharing. And that I, I don't think I fully understood it until I had kids and specifically till right. I had Noah. Obviously, for the girls, I do anything. I, I, there was a video going around social media the other day where they were asking a bunch of moms, like, would you kill for your child? And the moms were like, I don't know. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, yeah, I do anything, especially for my girls. Well, I'll get but like then, done right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, right the second my there. son was but, born, yeah. I was like, I just became a murderer. Yeah. yeah <laughs> if I but, needed to be. Uh, yeah. Um, but no, for for Noah, like, you know, he chases his dreams and and I get that comment all the time. Like, oh, it's so cool that you're doing this for your kid, taking him out in the boat and all this stuff and sacrificing this. And I'm like, well, I, I think I learned that from my dad. More importantly, I think I fully understand it now that I'm on the other side. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, I, I would do anything, anything at all. If he had a vision and I said, hey, this, unless it's just crazy, you know, if he has a, a vision that makes sense and I knew he was going to chase after it, I'd, I'd give every last, last penny to see it succeed. Yeah. And yeah, he's yeah, man. he's working hard and, and you're yeah. teaching me values and stuff. It's not like you're just spoiling him or something. Not, uh, we don't enable. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. For sure. Big difference. Yeah, for sure. Sorry, yeah, Justin, so you see. were about to go. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I like that you're jumping into the boat already. So I kind of wanted to get into that. Um, what do you think as a father? It, it's why is it so important to get your kids out of the house, especially nowadays and get them into the outdoors? And, and what are some of the hobbies you and your kids have together doing that? Man, I grew up in a family that loved the great indoors. Like we, we did. I, I loved being outside and we did. We grew up in Woodside Circle, West Tupelo before it was overdeveloped. There were you know, lots of woods. We played paintball. I was big into BMX. Um, but like my family really spent a lot of time inside and, uh, it wasn't like we weren't encouraged to be out much. I wanted to be out. And, um, that is a little bit of a, like, Hey, it's going to be different for my kids. We're going to be outside. All of my kids I've, I've taken into the woods hunting, 
ducks and geese with me starting at the age of seven um, because I want them to learn the value of hunting. I want them to learn the, the, the like failure of hunting, you know, the lessons that come with, Hey, it was a bad hunt uh, or the excitement of, Hey, it was fantastic. Uh, as soon as they start hunting, I teach them how to clean birds. You know, this is, and they all love eating wild game. Uh, they're obsessed with it. So if I go on a hunting trip, their first question is not how many did you kill? It's how much meat did you bring home? Like they want to eat it. Yeah. Uh, and then being outside in the boat, my best friend growing up was a, a junior pro wakeboarder and we spent a lot of time on the water and I always told my wife who did not grow up loving the water at all, like, Hey, we're going to have a boat at some point when the kids are old enough, we're going to, we're going to be on the water and she's all in now, thankfully. But man, when we're, when we're hunting, ducks and geese, which is a big part of my job with the dogs. Um, I breed dogs specifically for people who duck hunt, pheasant hunt, upland hunt. So a large part of my job in the fall is traveling and hunting with those clients. And my, my kids get to go along a lot. Uh, and when we're on the boat, on the water, there's no screens. You know, no, no one's begging for their attention. Uh, there's no YouTube. There's no, you know, dude perfect screaming in my ear you no know, offense to those guys it's, it's great content but like that's all it's just us we're talking we're spending time together we're trying hard things we're moving um so for me it's it's imperative uh, especially in this age where you know i meet a lot of kids and talk to a lot of families and the amount of time spent on screens is just it's incredible it's it's sad really and so for us we want our kids to to grow up a little different than that we want them to experience uh the great outdoors and and look you guys twins grew up in uh ridgeway uh i don't know how long you lived there but you were there for a while i used to ride my bike to ridgeway Dude, I, I used to ride near you we, yeah jordan three, and i would ride with you every three, now four again. miles right i mean i ride a bmx bike through neighborhoods across pernell road go to the country club and swim in the pool and then ride across the golf course, get cussed at by a bunch of old golfers that were mad, and then go through <laughs> Sunnydale to Ridgeway. Well, I'm like five, three, four, five miles from home, no cell phone, on a bike. Got to be home by dark. Yep. Those days are over. Yep. No kids doing Unfortunately, that. Unfortunately, right? Yeah. It's just the, the world we live in. It's not happening. So I've constantly been trying to figure out, okay, what can we do so that my kids can have similar experiences to that? Is it like if we go to the lake? and we, we park in a cove somewhere and they want to go to the beach and like hike up the trail by themselves and everything in me saying, well, that's dangerous. And I'm like, no, 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 they got to do that. They got to go learn to do that because they can't ride five miles across town anymore. Those days are gone. So if it's on a hunt and it's like, Hey, you want to go scout the field for us two fields over and see if there's any geese in there sort of thing like that, just figuring out ways that they can, if they can live similarly to how I grew up, in a day and age that's very, very different, um, is, is important to me. Yeah. That's I, awesome. I've thought a lot about that too. Right? I have a only child who's a daughter and, uh, yeah, it, it's hard to find places where like, I don't have to be fully involved because there's just creepy people out there, like everywhere you go. And, um, there's just not a lot of places really, unless you're like way out in the wilderness somewhere where you can kind of just let them roam a little bit because there's just so many things to be vigilant about. So uh, it's definitely a, a challenge um, for anyone really yeah. where they're living. But, you know, I, it's I guess if you have any more suggestions, I'm, I'm all ears because <laughs> I could use a few myself. But I like the idea of getting out in nature because it's a little bit more kind of let them walk ahead of ways and stuff like that. Yeah. And they're not, they're not attached to technology or even really looking for it out there. You know, I live, um, you know, we have nearly 20 acres out here and, and it's off the beaten path. And so my kids usually wake me up outside. You know, I wake up and they're flying past on a one wheel holding two cats, you know, and I'm like, what is happening? You know, it's six in the morning. Why are you awake? But they wake up and the first thing they do is go outside all three of them. I mean, my son this morning, <laughs> I had a, a near panic attack. Um, I'm in my lodge right now, which is a little place where we host clients and, and we host our puppy days and all that. And my house is about 150 yards that way. Well, this morning, Noah was nowhere to be seen, just gone. 
and I was, and my phone randomly would not turn on. My wife's out of town. I don't know if you ever had this happen, but my iPhone would not come on for two hours. Just I couldn't make it come on. And I'm I'm, I'm not like a tech nerd, but I'm pretty tech savvy with an iPhone. I was doing all the trick. I couldn't get it on. And Noah was nowhere to be seen. And I was like, is this is it something happening? Like, what is going on? Anyway, he he woke up, went and let all my dogs out over here. There's 18 Labradors in the kennel. And then his computer was in the lodge. So he just came over here, uh, brought himself some Eggo waffles over here and was doing his schoolwork. He was just on his computer doing schoolwork at 715 this morning. And I love that, man. We, you got to have a little bit of land, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're a buddy of yeah. mine, country singer, Jordan Davis, you know, he wrote that buy dirt song and I'm all in on that. You know, I love invest, his stuff. Invest in a space for your kids to be able to be outside, whether it's your space you live or just a place where you can go like a hunting camp or something you lease where they can just be outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. And Jordan's actually one of my favorites because, you know, I moved to Louisiana, but yeah. I'll say this, man. I think about North Mississippi all the time, and I, I never thought I'd ever say that. But now that I have a son, I want to go on adventures and be outdoors because it's like you said. Honestly, like I feel like God it wants us outdoors. God wants us out in nature, and that's where we're supposed to find peace and we're supposed to find ourselves and and learn to you know survive and stuff. So I, I find myself more and more wanting to get up there and, and go hunting with my brothers and and just. I mean, heck, I just bought a 308. I was like, I know it's a little overkill for deer, but it's still going to be fun. Yeah. And I wanted something I can take up to uh, the mountains in Colorado with some buddies and, you know, go elk hunting and stuff. But, uh, man, I, I find myself missing that property because I live in the heart of Lafayette and it's awesome. Mm -hmm. It's big city meets little town. It's nice. But at the same time, like, I don't have, you know, like you said, the 28 suburbia. Percent. Yeah, yeah, it's. It, I, I miss that. I, I have to be honest. Like, I never thought I'd miss that. You can. I, mean, I was first, a black sheep, you know. After so. the, you know, even before really the fall, you know, Adam and Eve are, are tasked with cultivating that garden, and then after the fall, they're tasked with you know ruling over creation, and and uh, the same exact task is given to Noah when they come off the ark. You know, you need to rule over this and. There's definitely something uh, primal is not even the right word because it's, it's really just a God given foundational like divine. Need. Yeah. Yeah. Divine uh, calling that it, and I'm, maybe there are people who live in suburbia that find ways to like bring that out, you know, but for me um, I, it's got to happen outside somewhere and, and I want my, yeah, want my kids to experience that. So thankfully the Lord has blessed us with the ability to do that. If we didn't live here, I would just, I've got a friend who, what he does is uh, instead of, we don't do Christmas gifts, we do trips and he does the same thing for Christmas and birthday and they do um, national parks. So constantly awesome they're just idea. traveling to, to national parks and hiking and figuring out ways to keep, so you don't have to, you know, if, if you're, if you're listening and you're like, I can't buy 20 acres where I live no worries. You know, there's other ways to get your kids outside. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, most, if you're listening from the U S almost every state has some pretty amazing mm -hmm. terrain somewhere, um, yeah. maybe a little bit of a drive, but I've, I've crisscrossed most of the U S and every state has kind of its own unique, uh, you know, whether it's desert or forest or mountain, there's, there's some pretty impressive places in the U S. So, um, you know, just getting out there and especially for your younger kids, like the first time they see something like that, Oh, you know, it's, it's one thing to see it in a book or on the internet, but to be there in person and to witness it for yourself, is just, you can't top that. So it's definitely a, a great suggestion to get your kids outdoors. Um, Barton, I wanted to get back to a little bit, uh, you know, taking the leap, getting your, uh, you know, dog training and kennel business going and um, one, the lessons through the journey, but then also now on the back end, like what, that whole process has helped you take into fatherhood moving forward and to apply. Yeah. You know, I was working for the church in Tupelo and it was, um, it was really an awesome job. I loved working there. And some of the things that I learned there and that I was tasked with doing, I didn't plan it this way, but they were things that became like the crux of why our business was successful. The biggest one would be community development. So I was the family discipleship pastor, but my job really was like bringing people together for 
youth events for life group, you know, getting people in life group. And I, I, I did feel my two giftings when I worked there were teaching and then, and then building community. And so when I started Southern Oak Kennels, I knew how to train dogs. Well, I, I've, there are people out there way better than me. There are people way worse than me, but I, I knew how to get the work done. That's really like, can you do it or not? You know, it, it is what it is. And then I was blessed with, you know, my dad backing me financially and, and the ability to bring over some really nice dogs from the UK that, uh, that were the type of dogs I wanted to breed. And that's really a thing you, you learn, like how to produce nice dogs. But what really took our business to the next level quickly, we're, we're 11 years old right now. Uh, and, and, one of, if not the largest British lab kennels in the USA and have been very successful in that amount of time. And the, the thing that I attribute that to is the community that we've built. And that was really from inadvertently taking what I was doing at church and just like applying it to what I was doing with business. And that was taking people and finding people that had the same passion and figuring out ways to bring them together, both social media wise and in person. And so I've loved bringing that over into what we do as a family. And that's, um, it's, it's one of my favorite things. And my wife is, she's a, she's an Enneagram type four. She's not antisocial by any means. <laughs> she's just way more introverted. And for me, all that means is being in a social setting drains her. I'm extroverted. Being in a social setting charges me. So if she's out of town, I'm never alone. I'm like, no, nah, someone's coming over. You know, if I'm out of town, she's like, I'm by myself drinking coffee, reading a book. This is the best day. I'm like, that sounds like the worst day. Um, so as a family, we've had, I've had to work hard to balance that well with her, but I love creating community. So wakeboarding is a good example. My, my son loves to wakeboard. I just got back from Houston, Texas with four other dads, uh, a guy who's a former pastor who leads a, a wakeboard ministry called Wake Well. We all stayed at a house in Texas. It's the second year we've done this trip. Uh, all the dads are believers. Uh, we all care about discipling our kids. All the kids are national competitors at wakeboarding. And we end the season by going to this really fun grassroots tournament and then spending three days at a buddy's house, wakeboarding in his backyard and talking about Jesus. And the whole deal is just that it's community. It's like we, we text all year long. It's called the Rad Dad Wake Club. And it's, it's a, it's a, like, I don't, I don't know that I thrive in that environment. I want there to be community around some sort of passion. And when you can infuse that with Christ, it's awesome. And with kids, it's, especially with us, we homeschool. So our kids aren't around like their classmates all day. So I really have to take like, Hey, they have to have some community. What is that? For my girls, it's horseback. Uh, for all of our family, it's jujitsu. Uh, and then wake like lake life and then just the people around us that live in this area church um, building that community I would say is the one skill that I learned through through seminary and church I applied to my business and then now inadvertently have applied to our family and I think it's probably one of the most important things that we do that's, that's awesome. great yeah god you 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 kind of made me feel like Got, gave me the chills a little because what you applied is what we're trying to apply to fatherhood and like just this community we're trying to build. So it, it gives me hope to know that, you know, others have seen success applying the same thing. So it's it's nice to know. Sorry, Jordan, yeah. I'm going to cut you oh, off. No, no, no. No, uh, I, I'll uh, say one more thing about that. Like I, I travel all over the country and duck hunt with a lot of people and some of them no one will ever heard, hear of ever. Some of them are like super well-known people in the U.S. and 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 then I go to wakeboard tournaments all over the country. And there are a lot of times that you could go to duck camp, deer camp, wakeboard, you know, competition. And like, from a spiritual standpoint, you leave and you're like, I need to take a bath. Like I'm, I'm dirty. You know, like this is, this is not, not the experience I, I needed spiritually speaking. <laughs> and I, I, that challenged me a lot because there were trips that I was like, I can't take my son on this one. And, and then I was like, well, and actually my wife, who's the discerning one was like, well, why are you going? You know, I was like, dang, <laughs> you know, I can, why you gotta ask those questions? But you know, for God, me, I mean, yeah, mama got you. <laughs> very, she, she's, she's, I trust her. She's the wise one. Um, but 
being able to go on these trips and, and orchestrate them in such a way that you leave and you're like, all right, we accomplished like the main goal. We wakeboarded, we shot ducks, we whatever that is, and whatever your thing is. But we also left and we love Jesus more. And I was challenged to be a better dad or a better husband. My kid either was influenced by or was able to influence some other kids for Christ. You know, that to me is like, if you're trying to figure out where to go with your kids and their hobbies, that to me is the ultimate. Even if it's tournament baseball, you know, like, hey, you got a group of dads that love Jesus. Get on a team. And yeah. Figure out like, all right, win or lose this tournament. How can we travel here and come home next week and look more like Jesus? How can we do that? That's and great. it takes some work, but man, it's, it's, that's, that's been, that's like the passion I have right now for what we do with our kids. That's really cool. It's a great example. We had a, a previous guest, Dave Powers talked a great deal about, he homeschools his kids too, talked about um, how he's really intentional about drawing other men in specifically for his boys for like rites of passage and to also make sure that they have like a community of other men around them and stuff. And so it sounds like you're, you're building a very similar um, structure for your kids to have different, um, you know, cause yes, of course you as the parents are the number one, you know, you're the primary educators, both, you know, academically, spiritually, everything. Right. But you don't want to just rely on your own understanding. There's obviously value, like for you, your uncle was a great source of, mm -hmm. um, you know, growth for you. So that's cool to see that you are building these communities, um, for each of your children. And it's a great example that we can kind of try and emulate. And now my, the gears are turned to my head too. I'm like, okay, how do I replicate something like that with my daughter? Because it, it, it's just instantly the efficacy of it is very obvious, right? Long, long term, that's going to pay off so, mm -hmm. so much more than we could probably imagine yeah. uh, from the onset. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. So I guess we'll come back to a question I'm going to have about like the trips and the stuff you did with Noah and, and your kids, but um, is there like a specific point in your life or something that really just kind of brought you to Christ like completely like that aha moment, you know? Yeah, really too. Um, at the age of seven, uh, I heard the gospel preached at my church. I grew up at Calvary Baptist church in Tupelo and yeah, I was seven. I was young, but for the first time, I felt like rather, I mean, I could have told you all the answers to the gospel questions at, as soon as I could talk. I grew up in the Bible belt, man. Like I knew those answers, but for the first time I felt like it was preached to me. I was like, Oh shoot. Like, and I, I remember there were some, there were some specific sins that like came to my mind and I was like, Oh, I need forgiveness for those. And, uh, and this guy's told me how I can get that. And, so at seven, at maybe at eight, I think after my birthday, I was baptized here and I, I believed the gospel and I really believe at that moment I was saved. And then there's this weird thing that happens in the South where people are like born again, again, you know, it's like they, they get old enough to like really know. And they're like, Oh, now I'm really getting saved. Um, like I had that experience, but I knew I was saved. I was just like, Oh, like I'm, I'm walking into a deeper level of faith here um and that was really in high school with my uncle um hearing hearing him preach hearing other people around him preach um my mentor spiritually past him was a guy that had a ministry with him and you know he's a very successful pastor nowadays and uh you know hearing those guys really preach the truth i was like hey i'm this is this is deeper than what i thought it was um the gospel is more than just you know, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved and he'll forgive all the stuff you do and then just go live your life. Um, and so as I matured and, and I was really playing music at that point, so it became important. And that's really what led me to think, all right, whatever I do after this, I want it to be somehow connected to this gospel that, that has impacted me. So that was like 17. Um, and, and when I went to, I'll add a third layer to that. When I went to Criswell, I really plugged in with that pastor I mentioned earlier, my uncle, a couple of professors at school. And I took like a biblical literacy test when I got there. And I would have told you before I took that, like, I'm about to ace this thing. Um, part of that is I just always have a lot of confidence in my ability to get through a standardized test. 
And the other part is like, I grew up here. I thought I knew the Bible. I made like a 34 out of 100. I mean, just like total failure. You There's know? a lot. What? Big book. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I thought I knew this. You know, I knew the Sunday school stories, you know. And that first year of school, when my eyes were open to the depths of, for me, it was Reformed theology. Um, I was just blown away. At that point, I was like, okay, I'm going to have to really, really plug in deeper here because this is this is uh, either immensely important or not important at all. And it can't be somewhere in the middle. So um, that was th those three sort of stepping stones saved it at eight, um, like committed to some type of pursuit of ministry at 17 and then like drug into the depths of <laughs> theology at, at college right before I met my wife. Um uh, you know, at, at 19, 20. It's so great that you plugged in, like that's your kind of your, your third community, right? I mean, other than the wakeboarding and the, the hunting uh, church, I mean, so dads, uh, if you're looking for a brotherhood where you have men that you can trust that will be holding you accountable in a loving way, you know, the church is small group specifically or discipleship group, man, that's such a great place to plug in. And that's where summer and I uh, are pouring in for our kids because, you know, that they do go to, to public school or TCPS and, you know, they get some great community there, but church is where we really want them to have that foundational community because they're seeing other kids loving Jesus and it's encouraging them. Okay. I see him super happy. Right. I want more of that. Right. And so, that's where we really try to plug in for community. But um, yeah, church is, is probably the, one of the best places that, that we've experienced community in Tupelo. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. That was, that was great. Yeah, it is. And we went through, you know, we, we we're not at the church where I worked for 10 years and went for 12 years anymore and love the people there. That was a very tough transition. Uh, I'm a creature of habit and super brand loyal. So any type of change like that is very difficult for me. Yeah, uh, That's not to make it trivial, but um, we are at a great church now. We're at the orchard and, and uh, some of our best friends are there. My wife leads worship there. The worship team, we're all, we're all buddies with them. And um, my kids, Will Rambo. yeah, Will, that, man. Will's, he's a saint, the man. He's, he's the guy I was mentioning who takes his kids to all the, the parks. That's what they do. They travel all I the time. Like, yeah, I love you know, Will, man. He, uh, he married his, my brother, uh, Logan. So his wisdom his is, awesome. <laughs> well, Logan goes to church with us, see him there. Um, it's a great spot. And for my kids, like my son, he doesn't have a class. So like his, to what you said, Brandon, his Sunday morning class, that that's his buddies, you know, that's the group of guys he knows. And, uh, and then my, my daughter's in the youth group, which is mind blowing to me because I was a youth minister, you know, for 12 years. So she should not be in the youth group yet, but she is. And that's like her deal with <laughs> yep. her community, you know, and her, her best friend that she hangs out with through the week is in her small group at youth group. So yeah, for sure. I mean, if you're, if you're looking out there for a place to start this community journey with like-minded, like faith individuals, then make that a priority for, for what you want to do with church. I mean, obviously you want to go somewhere where you can stomach the music. Hopefully you like it. You know, you want to go somewhere with somebody who's preaching through the word. For me, that's super important. But man, we undervalue community. You know, it's like, hey, can I come here and, and build some relationships and some friendships that influence me? you know, Monday through Saturday. Um, yeah. I feel like super, super important to what you said, Brandon. Yeah, the fellowship is super powerful, um, both for you as an individual, you know, man or woman, and then for your marriage and then for your kids, you know, there's like you said, connecting and um, especially for men, you know, for me, just in my own marriage, there were points where because I had a group of other Christian men and some of whom were much older than me, like set in their seventies, right. As part of our small group, were able to really talk me through either wrong think or kind of just, you know, be a vessel for God to kind of like, you know, shake me a little bit like, Hey, you're wrong, <laughs> you know? Um, and without that, I mean, I don't think we would have made it, you know, uh, mm. either, either my wife needed it too. Right. And so to, to discount, that aspect of what you get through being plugged into a church is uh it's dangerous really 
So yeah. I, I wanted to kind of go a little bit deeper on marriage. You know, you got married very early. Um, I certainly don't think I would have managed that very well at 21 and 19. Um, so yeah. I would assume that you've had a few struggles along the way. Um, <laughs> you know, what are some lessons learned through that? And did, how early did you guys start having kids? How many years were you married before? I mean, lessons learned from and my wife. She would fully agree. Uh, lesson learned from getting married at 21 or 19 is don't do that. <laughs> I tell people all the time, like I, <laughs> I would marry her again tomorrow on my doorstep, but um, 10 of 10 do not recommend getting married that <laughs> young. Um, we, we were very young and that's a Bible college kind of thing. You know, she had already had one guy propose before I met her and it was her first semester at school. So it was, uh, I met my wife and, and we started dating uh, kind of casually just, Hey, I like you. You know, I went to Bible college, dude. Like if a pretty girl shows up, that's like, if a girl shows up, that's like one for every seven or eight dudes. I think if a pretty one, like a good looking girl shows up, that's, that's a, that's a unicorn. So I was like, all right, I got to figure this, this whole thing out. And, um, I had not met her family yet. And I wrecked my sport bike with her on the back of it. The twins remember I used to, I used to race, Moto GP sport bike. I remember hearing about that. <laughs> yeah, dude. So that's how I met her like, dad. Oh, like, God. here's your daughter and what's left of her arm. You know, it was not, not, I had a lot of road rash and uh, so did I had a bunch of road rash. It was a bad one. Um, and, you know, that was a big watershed moment for me. I wrecked this motorcycle with her on the back of it and I held onto her for a second. I had my, my right arm on the pavement of uh, I 635 in Dallas. There were probably 200 sport bikes. It was on bike night. Uh, I was in a group called uh, Texas or Dallas Stunt Riders, which is stupid. Um, and it, they were someone has it on film. They were filming us. I've never seen it. And as soon as I my arms started to get really hot, I let her go. And I remember in that moment, I was like, I, I felt her flip, and then I flipped, and we were we were going like 60 miles an hour. And I was like, I may have just killed this girl, and I really like her. And it was this like gut punch like how could you be so childish like it was an immediate grow up moment i don't know if you've had any of those but it was like i went from here to up here really fast and um I, she was fine we were both all right and i met her family and um we we met in july started dating that happened in august we got engaged uh new year's eve that same year and got married in july so we had our one year dating anniversary as a married couple Wow. So, very quick. What did uh, her dad say to you? Um, you know, he, he, he's, he's <laughs> I don't not, think I'd be too happy if my daughter first time I'm meeting no, her. He's, uh, a, he's, he's a great guy. He's a missionary in Kenya. Um, and he's, he was a worship pastor in Texas at that point in time. And he's a, I, I, I learn a lot from him and he helps temper me a good bit. He is significantly more passive than I am because I would have killed me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm an Enneagram eight son. It would have been ugly. Hey, we're the same. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. My literally. rifle's right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thankfully he was gracious, you know, and, uh, I, I did, I drove her home and I was like, Hey, I did this. You know, I'm, I'm really sorry. Nice to meet you guys. I really like your daughter. Um, sorry about this whole deal. Uh, I, I manned up and handled it like I should have, but it, it was not super fun. Um, but we, we fell in love very quickly. We had the same faith. Um, same faith backgrounds and personality wise were very different enough that where we, we got along. Well, um, I can't be around, like I, I could have married someone who was an Enneagram eight or any, any, and I, the Enneagram wasn't even out then. I don't think, but somebody that challenged me would have been a problem. Little did I know how much she would challenge me later on. Cause she's, I mean, there's, she's so sanctifying in my life. I mean that in a positive way. Like I'm, I am such a, a better human being because of my wife. Um, but we got married at an age where she never experienced like any type of like college going out, having fun, being your own person. She went from living with her parents to living with a roommate and dating me. And, um, it, you know, yeah, several years in, we, we had a really rough patch. Uh, I don't even know how many years in that would have been, I guess like eight, nine, 10 years in, uh, where we, we barely made it out still married. Um, I mean, it was, it was rough for years. Our, we had young kids. It's a lot to go into. We had a, a failed adoption, which is a, 
one of the worst experiences in my entire life. Um, yeah. I mean, three years of just really like absolute darkness uh, while trying to start a business, having other kids that are healthy and happy and you're trying to enjoy being a parent. And the Lord brought us through all that and was in incredibly gracious to us. And uh, here we are happily married 15 years and, and truly like at a point where like we really love being married. Like we're, it's, yeah. it's super fun. Um, we had kids at, um, Naomi was born in 2010. We got married in eight. So two and a half years into our marriage, we had our first child and we had them two years apart uh, after that. And then we so had- how old were you when you became a dad? Uh, I was 20, 23? 23, yeah, 23 and a half. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, young, dude. Which Very is crazy because I thought that was like, I was like, oh, it's normal now. Like people are like, yeah, I'm getting married. I'm like, how old are you? Like 21. I'm like, dude, do not do, <laughs> please hold the phone. Uh, but yeah, it was, I think, it was, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of this is kind of like our way of life is different. I think, sure. you know, I know, uh, you know, like my grandparents, they were like one of nine kids, you know, both sides sure. of the family. And I think just people just started earlier. You, you could afford to, I would argue, uh, that, that's all, that's a topic for another episode. But, I think if the Lord had left me on my own through the rest of my twenties, I don't know that I would have made it. Yeah. 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 I'm being honest with that. Yeah. I think my wife is, and she would interpret that as like, Oh, I'm the boring one. And you didn't have as much fun. It's not that it's just, I was incredibly reckless. Yeah. You know, and, and she was really like the thing that grounded me. So I think it was a little bit of the Lord's intervening. Like, Hey, you're not going to make it through your twenties. If you don't have something, that, something that keeps you living. So angry. So, it's not exactly. good that you should be alone. Here's one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the feel that way. When she's out of town, I'm like, this is the worst thing for me. Like, I am the worst version of me when she leaves. I'm like, I, I need you to just be home. Like, it, it's everything is better. She's, she was supposed to be gone until tomorrow, and they're driving home tonight. So I was like, thank goodness, you know, I, I can't even like go to sleep. I'm just like, ah, the, the, the world's not right if she's not at the house. Yeah, and I think I think it was a blessing. Like for Summer and me, we met when we were 15 and 16. So you know, going on 23 years, it's like. I look back and it's like, man, the end of my high school days and then my college years would have been disaster for my life if I didn't have summer in it. So I, I, I feel I mean, exactly mine were. What you feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah because I, I didn't was have single. anybody. <laughs> yeah. Well, but no, with that said, were you guys equally yoked as far as your walk and, or mm -hmm. did she? Okay. No, for sure. I was going into ministry and this this is a, uh, it's kind of, I don't know how much we want to get into this, but it's a good subject. It's just, um, I don't know how much we want to get into like marital counseling, but no. I was going into ministry. Her dad, uncle, uncle, granddad were pastors. So her identity was I'm, I'm a, I'm a female in the Baptist world living under a, a, a man who is the head of the house, who is a Baptist minister. That was the world she grew up in. So obviously, you know, dating a guy that had tattoos and rode a motorcycle was her like rebellion, but I was going to be a minister. I was in seminary, you know, like it was like, I didn't go, she didn't go too far. She went like two blocks over, you know, she didn't go to the next neighborhood. <laughs> so I was in ministry and all was well. We moved to Mississippi. She, she, she's from Texas. Um, she did not want to come here, but once we had kids here, she, she loved it truly to what you said, Justin. I mean, it, I, I wanted to leave this place and put it in the rearview mirror and never come back. And then now I'm like, I can't think of a better place to raise kids than like where I am. Um, kids change so it. it's, it's, there's, there's, you know, it's give and take, but I love Dallas, Texas. I love the big city. We moved back here. I'm working in the church. And then I start doing this, this new business. And then fast forward, all of a sudden she's the wife of an entrepreneur who's traveling around the country three months out of the year hunting and is no longer working at a church. Well, that's like a full blown identity crisis for a girl whose whole life has been, I live under the roof and around surrounded by men who are working for the church. There's, there's a whole, but then that led to the unraveling of my whole life. I've had to look the part of a minister's wife or a minister's daughter or a minister's granddaughter. Cause there's a lot that come in and that's a yeah, big a lot thing. Of and we try so hard. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, yeah, I'll give you, a, it's going to make me emotional, but I'll, I'll, I'll share with you how this has impacted our life. So my youngest is like wild. She's ADHD. She's the definition of it. She's awesome. 
But because of her ADHD, she forgets stuff. Like tonight, she forgot to take her belt to jujitsu. I can't really even get mad at her. She literally got it out and put it in the driveway and then just left it in the driveway. Like that's that, but her brain works that way. We pulled up at church a few months ago and she forgot her shoes. So we're walking into church and she's got no shoes. And I am livid. Bethany is like pretty much mortified. You know, as a mom, my kids showed up. Here we are at church, no shoes. What are people going to think of us? And yeah. yeah. And we know the answers to that. Like, is no one's going to care. But like in that moment, it's like, I'm so imprinted with like, she grew up and like, Hey, put a smile on girls. We're going to church. She has, she has two sisters. She's the middle. So put a smile on girls. We're going to church. You know, you, if you, if you look sad, if anything's wrong with you, it's going to reflect on your dad who works here. Right. And, and thankfully we've had all these great conversations with her parents about this too, which is great. I grew up with a dad who worked for the school system. And if I got in trouble in high school, maybe that impacts my dad's job. You know, like there's a lot of weird pressure there and we're walking to church and I'm just like so mad. I'm like getting the, you know, Miriam's boohoo and because she's embarrassed that she has to go to church without shoes on. And I'm like, Oh, you're going, you know, you're going in there. And Bethany's just like, can we please go home? You know, dude, I turn around my oldest daughter who's 12 is walking in with my youngest daughter and my oldest daughter doesn't have her shoes on. And I was like, what are you doing? And she's like, I just thought Marion would feel more comfortable if I didn't wear my shoes. And I was like, dang, man, I, I failed. You know, yeah. I, I succeeded if I raised you that way. Right. But man, like, I'm so worried about this stupid stuff that doesn't matter. And my oldest daughter is like, all I care about is that Marion wants to go into church. Like yeah. if I don't have to, if I can just right. go barefoot, then who cares? And man, that was, that was super impactful for me in the moment. And really is like this microcosm of my wife. And I realized I'm like, shoot, <laughs> we, the way the, the pressures that came from growing up the way we did. And from our first several years of marriage really weigh on us even still. And sometimes yeah. have this massive impact. And that, I'm glad you brought that up because that's, you know, that's kind of my personal testimony is like really unpacking your past, uh, especially like childhood and stuff and how that really weighs on your marriage and how you show up as a parent. And, um, you know, even if you were raised pretty well, had a pretty good upbringing, there's still some things that were probably not great. And mm -hmm. if you never identify that, it's not to play victim. It's not to be like, oh, I'm because my parents are horrible. I get to be horrible myself. It's you have to like figure out what went wrong so that you can mm -hmm. not repeat it or you can identify, Oh, okay. This is why I have a short temper or something, right? Whatever the thing is. But, For sure. Um, yeah. I mean that mindfulness and maybe it's therapy, maybe it's, you know, counseling, whatever. Um, doing some of that work to dig into that is, I think a lot of people don't do that and that's where they run into a lot of problems because yeah. you're always kind of reacting at, we could get way off into this, but your body actually trains itself as a physical response. So any, any stimulus anywhere in the world that is similar to the childhood stuff, your body takes over and you're not even thinking anymore. You're reacting like a, a traumatic response almost. And if you don't do any of that work, you can't untrain that response. And so you'll start snapping at people or whatever it is that how you lash out. So it's very serious. And I think a lot of people don't understand that you never, peel the onion back a little bit. There's no way to undo that. So, yeah. So you're, you said you're an Enneagram eight, um, obviously, you know, fairly, fairly type a, some type of leader or you wouldn't be doing this. Um, and I listened to a couple of the other podcasts. You wouldn't have done what you did in the military, all that. Right. Was it, and I hate to be like flipping the script and asking you questions, but oh, was good. it, was it difficult for you to accept the reality that you needed to have some counseling and some help? to peel the layers of that onion back in order for you to become better? Or did you have like this sense of like, oh, I can make myself better or I don't need that? Um, so I was never like against counseling. I had actually done it since I was like a teenager, you know, like therapists and stuff, but um, more intensive, like kind of group therapy things that I've got, you know, you go for like a week at a time. I've been to several different of those things. Um, were where I had those harder moments where I had to really confront, oh, I am this type of person or I have done these things, you know? And 
to and to not downplay them and to fully own it and to be like okay i've you know that's some of the darkness that i've done right and i can't undo that so um going forward i have to be better that type of thing so th those were the hard moments because it's like i didn't want to admit to myself that uh i wasn't as good as i thought it was right yeah. um and it, it really, you know, we a lot of people talk about this is wearing the masks. That was me uh, my whole life. You know, I'm the oldest and put on, you know, put on the brave face and, you know, achieve and all that stuff. And um, it gets heavy. It's really yeah. heavy. And, yeah. and internally, too, you're like, if they only knew, right? That's, that's the voice in yeah. your head. And so when you finally put all that down and you finally let off all this armor that you didn't need to wear, you can breathe again, you know, mm -hmm. like I just did it right now. <laughs> just yeah. thinking about it. And, um, so it's very freeing and liberating, but, uh, yeah, I'm really getting long winded no, here, but it, it's, if you don't do that work and you don't confront yourself, especially if you're a type eight or uh, similar to like you and me, uh, you're never going to recover. You're never going to heal. No. You're just going to drive people away from you. And, uh, I'm, I'm really glad that I had people in my life from multiple angles kind of step in and push me in the directions I needed to get pushed um, to be where I am today. Obviously, I want to keep growing and improving, but if I look back over the past 10 years, I mean, just the amount of growth <laughs> is insane. Yeah. You know? I feel that. it's It was tough for me. I was, I'm first born, all A's, 4.0 just didn't really take a wrong step. If I did, it was funny enough that people just laughed about it. You know, it was like, Oh, well you made a mistake, but it, you were funny, you know, like it. And, uh, getting to a low where I was like, I need help. And then someone saying like, well, I think this, you're the way you were raised and brought up might impact this. And it's like, what? Nothing's wrong with the way I was raised. You know, what are you talking about? And finally, and then my wife, <laughs> uh, after we had kids actually got a master's degree in, in Christian counseling and then pursued further education in trauma counseling. So she is a counselor and she, she counsels mostly women who have been victims of sexual abuse. So she's, she's the, the definitely the wise one. And she's the, yeah, she's, she's definitely the get it, get, you know, get deep in there and get it all out. And I'm just like, I don't really want anyone down in there. I don't want you. I don't want you. I don't want to talk about that. And so it, it took me years to be like, okay with working on myself for sure. And, and allowing somebody else to like truly hear, Hey, this is how this impacted me. And it might be impacting how I raise my kids, you know, and yeah. how I love my wife and all that. And pain, pain and grief, both. There's a, the, there's a bit of that denial that, mm -hmm. that you've brought yourself to that place or yeah. you, your, your past has done that. And so for me, like I'm the guy that always wants to fix it myself. Like I grew up wanting to be a psychologist and I was always a psych buff and reading books. And like when I wasn't fitting in, I'd read books about being social, you know, like I was just the kid that was trying to fix it myself. I wasn't leaning. And I think it was because my dad was gone Monday through Friday. I didn't have the person to lean on other than my grandfather. And I saw him maybe three or four times a year. So it, for me, it was fixing it myself. And man, I can, I can definitely relate to how tough it is to root out something that's not good for your life because you're having to kill a part of yourself and it's mm -hmm. painful, mm -hmm. but that, you know, realizing you're in that state of denial and then addressing it. Like, luckily I had summer and summer would just say, Hey, look, this is something that you, you do. And whether you fix it yourself or you seek help, you got to do something to do it because it's, mm -hmm. it's going to harm your relationships. And so, yeah, man, that's that's a huge part of uh, of keeping a, a marriage intact as well, for sure. I, you know, if, yeah, I'm reflecting on a little bit to kind of re-answer your question, Barton. Um, it was the the fear of when you finally admit to others, yeah, who you are, who yeah, you really sure. are, and what you've done, and the fear of like, I'm everyone will reject me and yeah. no one will accept me and they're going to hear me say this and they're going to be like, dude, who are you? And they're going to leave this session. Right. As I say, you know what I mean? And then have the exact opposite happen after you let it out. And there's yeah. just nothing but acceptance and for sure, not, not, not to like downplay any wrongdoing you've done, but to just be like, Hey, we've all screwed up. And, uh, it took a lot of courage to say that. 
and then we build up these false walls you know they're like invisible barriers that we convince ourselves are there and the second you step out in vulnerability like that um they all disappear <laughs> you know and you were the one who put them there in the first place you being self not not you to me but yeah that's the perfect yeah. analogy that's the analogy that my counselor used with me when when my wife was going through a really really difficult bout of depression uh and then flipped the script and used it on me when we realized that this was my issue was different but to, she had built this wall around her heart that was everything that was good that was spoken about her was untrue and not believable and everything that was ugly was true and the wall went up and it was like hey i only accept these things and i was like i don't know how to fix this to your point brandon i was like i don't know what i can do because she's i tell her like hey i actually look like you're beautiful you're a beautiful human you're wise you're this you're a great mom and none of these things are are getting in and he was like it's just sit at the wall and take these rocks of truth and chunk them at the wall and he was like, eventually you're going to bust a hole big enough for some light to get through. And that's your job. You can't break the wall down at once. You're not going to, but just throw rocks of truth at the wall, whether it's scripture or truth about her. Well, then that script flipped on me because my wall was you're tough. You got it. You don't need any help. You know, you, you can't make mistakes. If you do just pretend like it didn't happen, you know? And so that's the wall that's got to be torn down for me all the time, every day. I have to ask the Lord to do that. Just, hey, remind me that I'm not totally self-sufficient and self-reliant. I need you. I need this family. I need community. I need all these things because in my flesh, I don't need anything. You know, I'm totally good. And that's not the truth. You're yeah. such a type eight. <laughs> real problem. You're like the I, same I, person. I, was say, I, I like how we talked about who's the eldest and, and some of the things. Like It's so important. With, if you have kids, fathers with siblings it's so important that you are present um i'm a great example of that i'm the eldest in my family i'm one of four um brandon kind of carved his own path he's he's always been his own who he is you know and i had jordan and logan constantly following me around so i was kind of their only example like on a regular daily basis besides my parents and I, like that gets heavy it's a burden after a while you know and and that's why it's so important to be present. And that's one of the reasons, honestly, I we all started this was one of the the brainchild ideas from this in my head was we need to we need to bring more attention to the things that parents need to be doing or that we need to be doing ourselves as parents. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for two things: my father being present, and a song by uh, actually probably my favorite artist NF. It's called Mansion. And literally everything you guys have said or related is exactly what that song is about, except for he's had so many, so many trials and tribulations. He lost his mom to an overdose. And uh, he just talks about how he never lets anybody in because it's it's scary. And, and he talks about the walls and the different rooms in his mind that he has. And it's this big mansion. And, you know, it's, it's unbelievable what that song did for me. Uh, one of my darkest times. When I was going through a very public divorce and I was being uh, verbally abused on an absolute daily basis in my brain, I just, I kept trying to get myself out of that. And I, I started feeling like the, the person that this other person was telling me I was, and mm -hmm. this song helped me to deal and cope with those things, understanding that someone else knew where I was. And I still, to this day, I still struggle with it. I have walls up. And I have to say the most beautiful thing is that the day my son was born for the first time in my life, I felt like I could love someone unconditionally and know that they would hundred percent love me back. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a wall up for the first time in my life. Mm. And it was so freeing. And it's one of the reasons I knew I always wanted to be a dad, but um, I've never really shared that story, but my, my father and I were on a walk right before I went through my divorce. And, um, I kept asking him the same questions like, am I this person? Am I this? Do I deserve this? And he's like, absolutely not. And then he he suggested therapy to me and the things that he said to me and, and just being present and being there for me, I, honest to God, saved my life. So I love what you guys said, because, you know, walls and barriers are something as men we all build, and especially as fathers and sons. 
brothers, siblings, whatever the case may be. But if you have those feelings, I, I highly suggest any of you get help because we are so quick to say, I don't need help. Like Barton said, you know, we don't, we don't need this. I'm good. I'm tough. I'm this, mm -hmm. I'm that. Well, you can be this and that and you can still be struggling. You can still be hurting. You can still have walls so high that nobody's ever going to get them. So yeah, I don't mean to go on a tangent. And but, the, well, the help so. isn't also just like go see a therapist all the time. It's having like sure. a community of other like-minded guys a tribe. Or, or better guys who can kind of help you weed through the lies and help help pull you into what's true like Barton was saying and yeah it, it's not all just therapy right it, it's it's a lot there's a lot of outlets but just don't bottle it up and yeah. think you can just grit your teeth and bear somebody so, and it's super important for me to have somebody who's walked a little further down the trail that's a big one for me okay I, I know what's down here come on like you're you're good let's keep going because yeah, I become self-reliant and that wisdom they can pass on is good. That song is actually on Noah's uh, wakeboard playlist. Everything he does is incredible, man. He's, yeah. he's a genius. Uh, honest yeah. to God, I think he's the best lyrically yeah. that there's ever been. Yeah, he's, but, he's unreal. Um, I'm a little biased. So um, yeah. I, I kind of wanted to change gears here. We'll go to another happy place, but uh, we were talking about trips earlier, um, and obviously you guys spend a lot of time in the water, but as far as like land destinations, um, I want to hear a little bit about, you know, either your favorite place that you've taken Noah as a father-son duo, or, uh, you know, that you've taken the girls, I'm sure you've taken the girls on their own solo trip, like which, which dynamic worked with your son and which one worked with your daughters and which places did you like the most and why? Yeah, so my favorite place to take my son is my buddy's duck club called Wild Wings in Stuttgart. Uh, Connor Reddick's his name. He's one of my best friends on earth. And uh, they have a, I mean, for duck hunters, it's heaven. It's unbelievable. And it's green timber hunting. It's an incredible quick boat ride in where you're flying through trees. You're standing in the trees. The weather's usually not insane there. You know, a lot of the places I hunt, it gets pretty inclement. So this is uh, usually in the 40s and the hunts are usually pretty quick, which is good. If you're, if you're out there and you're considering taking your kids hunting, always, always make sure that their first few hunts are high, high, high likelihood of success. Uh, you do not want kids having to sit there and uh, learning patience is great. There's plenty of time for that. But if you want your kids to be outdoorsmen and like to hunt, they need to love it. And like going out and smoking a bunch of ducks, that'll, that'll do it. Um, going out and be like, this is what hunting is like. We sit here for four hours and don't see anything. They're not going to want to go back. So um, if you want to get them hooked, kill a bunch of stuff. And uh, this, this is Plan for success. Here. Yes. Yes. So, and then man, we cook and hang out at the lodge and have fire pit and it's really just like man time. So wild wings is my favorite place to take my son. The girls are, are a little different. They're honestly like lower maintenance than my son. He like has to be entertained all the time. He, he's constantly got to go. They're just happy to be with me wherever we go. My oldest daughter loves to go on hunting trips, just me and her. Um, but for them, the, the best trips for them are usually like either hiking um, go into a place where there's like waterfalls we can walk to or go into the beach. They love the beach. So the girls want to be in the sun, play on the sand, chill. They want me to sit there and watch them without a phone in my hand. That's what they want. They want me unplugged from technology and we don't even have to talk. They just want me to be present and sit there and hang out on the beach. So that's my favorite thing to do with them is uh, do a little, little beach trip. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit. I'm a I'm a very high type three, four, and seven, kind of a hybrid. Oh, and so I'm very introspective and very philosophical. And so my question to you, uh, and take your time if you need to, but if you knew your time on this earth was almost up, what piece of advice would you leave your kids? Oh shoot. Um, listen to your mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah she's the wise right, one. we're gonna wrap uh, right now <laughs> yeah, 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 cut. um no i'm still processing three four and seven four and seven that's that's great um yeah it makes a lot of sense for you truthfully no i mean that very my wife's a four wing three so um yeah uh for my kids last piece of advice if time is short man i would probably tell them to chase after the Lord surrounded by a community of people who were chasing after the Lord and the rest of it will work out. Um, Amen. 
the, the thing I'm thinking about is if that's my answer to this question, why don't I tell them that every day? That's, yeah. that's the, that's where my brain goes. Oh, yeah, shoot. So, oh, so the follow, I was going to say the follow up to that would be then what's, what's the legacy you hope to leave them? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's a great one. I think about that actually a lot. Um, and I, you know, for, I hope the things that they know are, I love their mom really well through difficult times and through the best times. And I've, worked my butt off doing something I believed in, but I never sacrificed my family to do that. So for me, the legacy has been building a, a, a business that two businesses that I really love and working really, really hard, but being able to look back and say, I still was able to prioritize my family. Um, that's, uh, that's why I get to do fun podcasts with guys like you is because I think that's been fairly evident, you know, um, but for me, that's, that's the legacy is the time. I can't replace that. Absolutely. You know, 12, 10 and eight, I have so many years gone right now. I mean, it's depressing. It is awful for me to think I'm over halfway there with my days of having them in my house. And I have days where I'd love to get back, but for the most part, I can say, Hey, I, would, I invested a lot of time. And so that's, that's the legacy for me. Nice. Yeah. It's, Legacy is a hard thing, man, because you, you think about it all the time and you're, you're trying to think of the different legacies you want to leave. Um, but yeah, actually, uh, you mentioned jujitsu earlier um, and that you have your, your kids in it. Um, I guess not so much what drove you to put the kids in it, but what do you, what have you seen the kids gain from something like jujitsu where there's discipline and respect and things like that? We have a whole other podcast. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, my kids started before I did the older two, um, Naomi and Noah started a friend of mine that I used to actually ride motorcycles with was a Taekwondo instructor who went heads head first into jujitsu about 14 years ago. And now he's got a Gracie, uh, certified training center here. And he would run into me in, around town and I'd have Naomi and Noah with me. And he was like, you need to get them in jujitsu. And I was like, dude, they're five. He was like, they need to start rolling. And I was like, all right, I'll think about it. So I started Naomi when she was, um, I think eight and a half, nine. Uh, and then Noah started at like seven and, um, he would always push me, you know, you need, you need to train, you need to train. I'm, I'm like, I'm in my thirties, you know, and, uh, to be blunt, I spent the first, I would say from like 22 to 32, 10 years, like avoiding exercise at all costs, drinking Mountain Dew, uh, drinking whatever I wanted to drink, eating whatever I wanted to eat and gaining weight with every kid and, and wound up at, um, in 2019, I was like 50 pounds overweight, very unhappy, didn't sleep, couldn't do a single pull up, couldn't run a mile, um, just was way out of shape. So I've spent the last four years trying to rectify that. Uh, and so at 36, I'm in the best shape of my life. And uh, starting jujitsu two years ago was definitely a, a massive piece of that puzzle. And there's a lot physically and philosophically, there's a lot that you can unpack there. I'm, I'm happy that we can go as long or short as you want. And, yeah, you, you, you learn a little bit about yourself the first time you get choked out. So. <laughs> or get punched in the mouth. You learn about how how a small person or a, a lot weaker person with really good technique can just dominate you in a matter people of seconds. Yeah. yeah, people don't get that. Yeah. I'm like, look, you see that little dude over there? He's 60 years old and he might like, weigh 150 right. pounds. But he could destroy every person in this room. You know? Yeah. So it's uh, it's yeah. I it's I can talk forever <laughs> about jujitsu. It's it's a huge passion of, of our whole family and there are so many things that jujitsu teaches you that one being one, you know, leverage is super important and, and learning how to use leverage, the pyramid principle, using how, you know, using the ground up, um, using strength from the ground, uh, for kids, that stuff is super important. And they learn really self-defense jujitsu. And then my son has started doing some competitive rolling. And this is, I've really kind of held him back from that because, for him, everything he wants everything to be a competition. He's a he's a boy, and I've wanted jujitsu to be a life skill for him before it was a sport. And so this is the first year I'm going to let him roll 
competitively, but he'll he'll take your arm off. He's he's a little savage on the mats. Um, <laughs> I love it. And then just teaching them like to jujitsu is such a great sport for learning how to just overcome difficulty. Like it, it's it's um, I, I have claustrophobia, and so rolling it. I, I and I'm also really big into no gi jujitsu. But when I roll in a gi and someone ties me up, I don't know if any of you guys train. George, you might you sound like I don't do jujitsu. I've done like I did. Well, I'm a black belt in taekwondo. I was super competitive yeah. growing up in that, um, and then did combatives and stuff in the military. So it's like pseudo jujitsu. Yeah. I was a wrestler in high school. Perfect. But, yeah, so all the bases. There. A lot of the same principles, where it's like for sure, Marshall. size doesn't always matter. <laughs> Technique is that's right. matters a lot, especially when it comes to like choking someone out. You know, yeah. like they get your back, you're done. That's very it. Quickly. I, yeah, I, like, I had a buddy in basic course. He was. I think he was a black belt in jujitsu, and you know I was like, "Oh, I'm a wrestler. I can take you." Whatever we were doing our combative stuff, bro. I've never been more humiliated in my life. Like yeah. two seconds, he'd have me like tapping every yeah. time, over and over and over for like an hour. I experience that two or three nights a week, and it's uh, yeah. it's tough. I make it a point to roll with as many people that are way better than me as I do people that I'm way better than, and it's it's character building for sure. And then just overcoming difficulties. Um, you know, there's a jiu-jitsu principle called the river principle, which is the, the water throws, flows around the rock. And that one to me is a huge one. You run into a rock, you don't just sit there and pound on the rock. Water goes around the rock. Figure out a way. And so we, we say work the problem. And my, you know, my son all the time, you know, Dad, I can't get this to work. I'm like, work the problem, dude. Like, figure it out. What are you going to do? You're going to have to make adjustments here. You can't just keep trying the same thing. There's a million little things like that from, from jiu-jitsu that uh, have been an awesome impact for our life. My wife does not work. I won't say we're like a jujitsu family. Um, as awesome as she is, she does not like any physical discomfort at all. So like if I come home and start messing with her, trying to put her in any sort of jujitsu pin and like two hairs get pulled, she's like, this is why I don't do jujitsu. Like she's, she's out on that. And she'll tell you, she would tell you right now. Yeah. I'm just not into pain. Uh, but the rest of the, the, my three kids and myself, we, we uh we love it. That's super fun. And secretly, That's as hilarious. a girl dad, you want your girls doing it so they can choke out some punk if he tries something right. I posted the uh, Instagram story of uh, me and Noah. It was like a, a couple clips of me and Noah working with Naomi. Um, she was doing some sweeps on me and uh, getting side control on me, and then um, swept my son and put him in an arm bar. And uh, I posted it, and I was like, just keeping her sharp so your dusty sons don't impress her with their YouTube career. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Love don't it. you worry. So, I love yeah, it. it's, it's, it's I'll crazy. tell you what. You know, George talks about how he got pinned a few times, but I've actually watched somebody from Tupelo in a pool party we went to get absolutely destroyed by George, and George is half their size, and it was hilarious. I died oh. laughing because this guy got so mad. He's like, man – Walked down the street, pissed off, and came <laughs> on back. I was like, "Oh, coyotes are us. Come on back." <laughs> I do you remember? I do remember the event you're describing. Yep, that was, yep, that was fun. <laughs> I mean, I still know how to um, wrestle. It's just when you go up against, if you go up against someone who knows jujitsu very well, they will yeah, dismantle yeah. you, regardless. Yeah, without a doubt. Of, of anything else. Yeah, there's so much about that on the internet. He doesn't work in the street or whatever. I mean, the the Gracie Combatives program is super great because it's truly is a street self defense program, and that's where we all started. So there is there are strikes, there are kicks, there are defenses of all that. Everything is within mind that somebody might punch you in the face. Uh, and then when you get into fun competitive rolling, it takes a whole different. You know, that's more wrestling, more pins, and then obviously submissions. And uh, I'm big. I'm six foot five, two thirty. So, and I'm, I'm not, a, I'm no longer a fat 230. I'm a healthy 230. So I have to, yeah. I have to remind myself of that when I roll with smaller guys that are the same skill level. I'm like, I don't really need to throw my weight around here. Cause it's, it's a lot. I'm, if I, if I get on your side, it's like parking a truck on there, but then there are some guys at my gym that are like 290. So I roll with them. I'm like, Oh, this, this is what it feels like <laughs> just to get absolutely desecrated by somebody huge. You know, it's, 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 it's good. It's good for you. Good times. Character building. Well, so one of the questions we ask every single dad, um, I guess, well, I'm trying to think of the way to word it for you. It's, um, so I guess we'll go, since you have three kids with a core memory, um, 
we usually say like either a story or a core memory that just really stands out to you from your your time as a father uh, that you just really want to talk about that you just have to share. Oh man, there's a bunch of those. That's uh, thankfully there there are a bunch of them. Um, we we do like I said we do trips, not presents for specifically Christmas and stuff like that, which is, is big for us because they have everything they need. I got so sick of putting stuff in garage sales and just, you know, they don't need any more stuff, but the trips are, are irreplaceable, you know. Um, for me, I would say the one of the, the most important ones uh, for me is it took a lot for me to convince uh, Bethany that we needed a boat. Um, it was, it was not, not on her list of things. And we actually had been through a really, really rough patch in our marriage and, uh, had spent some time kind of separated, kind of working things out ourselves. And when she came home, uh, I was like, Hey, we got to go to Alabama today to pick something up. And we drove to Alabama and she was like, what's that? And I was like, that's, uh, that's our boat. <laughs> you know, we're, we're getting that. And that summer, uh, our kids were, were pretty young. That was maybe 19. Um, but we did a trip with some very like-minded friends that I'd met in the hunting community. And we just spent three nights at their lake house with no cell phone service. Cooking steak, you know, grilling chicken. And every day out in the water with our kids, just who were oblivious that there might have been anything difficult or wrong with their parents or just in the world. And it really solidified for me, like, Hey, really like no matter what happens, I'm working for this. Like we're, we're here. And that I think is why boating is so important to us. Like we, we just, we go out on the boat. Like it's our family time unplugged every hour we put in the boat. People are like, you got a lot of hours in your boat. Like every one of those is hours I spent with my family. It's and kind of like, like an extended got, like dinner table almost. I literally have a tracker. I'm like, hey, this boat keeps up with every every hour it's running. That's that's all investment every single hour. And so that trip where they were little and they were like they were tubing. No one could wakeboard. Uh, they, we weren't into the board sports yet. They were just like jumping off, screaming, having a blast the whole time with friends who loved us and loved us very well in a difficult time. And sort of like they're four or five years ahead of us and then like kind of taken our hand and pulled us through. Um, that's probably the core memory for me that I was like, all right, this is, this is the path we're going to take raising kids and, and being parents and, and loving one another well so that we can love our kids. Well, it's good, man. I love it. Yeah. Um, wanted to ask before we kind of wrap here, what's, you know, kind of your top words of wisdom, top piece of advice for dads listening, man. Um, According to Barton. it's easy to say, be present. But like to that means a lot of things, you know, a buddy of mine, we joked about this earlier, a buddy of mine, country music singer has a be where your boots are song. And uh, I love that, like be where you are. But like I train dogs for a living for a while and a lot of, and I teach people how to train dogs through our app. And a lot of what we do is teach people how to read dogs, like read the dog's behavior. What's the dog telling you through its body language and all that. Well, for me, being present with your kids is reading them. I've got a son who has separation anxiety. I never had that. In fact, as my personality, like I was a guy that was like, what do you mean you have anxiety? Like about what? Like, what are you scared about? You know? And like, I would just dismiss it. You know, thankfully my wife helped me get through all that. And I'm, I'm no longer a jerk about anxiety. Um, I have a daughter who has ADHD and these are like trivial problems. But I, I wouldn't handle any of these well if I wasn't present and like listening to them. Like it's easy to react in the moment, but it's it's another thing to be present and say, what are they really going through right now? Like what's going on in their in their brain? How are they ticking? Uh, we all talked about Enneagram types, except for you, Justin, but I'm sure you know. But like, what's your kid's Enneagram type? Have you like studied your kid enough? And I'm not saying that's like a, that's not an end all be all, but like, can you describe your kid's personality and the way they react? And like, what is it that sets them off? What is it that makes them disappointed? For me, that's being present. It's like, I'm around my kid enough that I know how, I know how each one of them, they work. I know the ins and outs and 
Um, that's something that I don't think I experienced growing up a whole, whole lot. Um, and it's important as a dad for me. I know the triggers. I know when I'm at a concert and I can tell the auditory input is my son loves rocking out the metal, but I can tell it's starting to create some anxiety because I can just see it in his face. And I'm like, Hey dude, you ready to go? Let's go get a hot dog. You know, and we're out because I've recognized those things just because I pay attention. Right. That's it. <clears throat> I have failed at that a lot of times. Um, there are times where I've gotten really mad at Miriam because of something she did that it was just ADHD. Like that's the way her brain worked. And I got mad because it, it was, uh, you know, well, I'll get into this last thing on that. That's a great question. Uh, my biggest piece of advice for dads uh, when you have young kids is to only discipline your children for sin. The Lord only is ever angry at sin. And I'm very prone to get mad at my kids like if I'm inconvenienced or if they did something that's childish, right? They're children. Like that's what they're going to do. So my wife and I like made out this list and I'm sure it's probably written by lots of people. But for us, it was like uh, deliberate disobedience, dishonesty, deliberate destruction um, and uh, disrespect. So not respecting your elders. So those are the four D's of discipline. If it's not that, you just don't get in trouble. Like we tell you, hey, don't do that again. Like don't spill your milk in the truck. But um, we don't freak out about things that aren't part of those four things where it's actually like, hey, you, you really committed a sin here. And we need to teach you that sin has consequences and it's for the consequences go beyond just you. And that's what the Lord teaches us. And he punishes sin only because as a dad, I found it easier and probably worldlier to just punish things that I didn't like or made me late or spilled, you know, made me have to clean something up. So I was very guilty of that. And uh, I've had to apologize to my kids a lot, which is another piece of advice. Never be scared to apologize to your kids. Um, but I've had to apologize to my kids a lot and say, hey, you know what? I shouldn't have even gotten mad at you about that. That's on me. Because um, that's not, you, you didn't mess anything up. You, you didn't do anything wrong. So, yeah. That's a long answer, but that's no. It's that's really good, man. Uh, ooh, hit me right here, but I I'm just as guilty of, you know, disciplining or getting a little angry when you're inconvenienced. And I think every dad has had those moments, so I think we all know exactly what you're talking about. Um, but wanted to give a minute for you to kind of plug where people can get engaged with you, and especially if they're looking for dog training. And so, what what's the best places to connect with you? Sure, um, I'm on social just my name Barton Ramsey on uh on Instagram and Facebook and I think people sometimes follow me thinking it's going to be like a cool hunting account and it's just a dad account it's like me and my kids hanging out so it's a fun account to follow it's, yeah I appreciate that a lot of cooking uh and then Southern Oak Kennels and Cornerstone Gundog Academy Southern Oak Kennels if you're interested in a British Labrador Retriever Cornerstone Gundog Academy, if you have a dog or are getting a dog and you want to learn or uh, become a better dog trainer or dog handler, it's all on your phone, accessible on the app, over 600 videos of, hey, here's start to finish how you how you train a dog. So all that's on Facebook, on uh, the web, and on Instagram. Awesome, man. Very cool. Well, uh, I'll let you know if I'm in the market for a hunting dog. <laughs> Do it. I just want to go hunting with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah we should, we'll have to set up a present father's hunting trip. I would love yeah, to do that. I'm in a group of guys that do, do that. things like that. And I tell people all the time, I don't get to invite people hunting very much because most of my hunts I'm invited on. And it stinks because I have this massive list of people. I'm like, I love to hunt with that guy. Yeah. yeah. One day, maybe the Lord will bless me with this cool spot where I can take people hunting. Right now, right. I, I live in Guntown. So there's no <laughs> ducks here. <laughs> All right. Well, Barton, it has been an absolute privilege to reconnect with you and to uh, just learn from you and your stories and your experience. Um, just a wealth of information in this episode. So appreciate your willingness to share and and uh, just be real. And uh, yeah. I think I speak for everyone. It's been a real pleasure. So George, enough talk, dads. Or go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say thanks for having me, man. This was super fun. And, and I do a ton of podcasts where we just talk about ducks and dogs. So it's really, really refreshing to do one where we talk about stuff that is significantly and eternally more important. So I appreciate yeah. you guys doing this and using your, your platform for something that I think and hope will be a, a massively positive influence on, on dads out there. That's the goal, man. We just want to 
help dads out there because uh, we all have our own struggles and stuff. So thank you for contributing and, and uh, making a difference. So with that, dads, enough talk. Let's get climbing the mountain of fatherhood together. See you in the next one. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Present Fathers Podcast. Make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Spotify to catch all of our amazing episodes. We will see you in the next one.